Hello, I'm Boo Saunders and today I will read you a story from Crocodiles, Camels and Dugout Canoes, a book that I wrote and my wife uh, Roxy Monroe illustrated. Mary Kingsley. It is at these times you realize the blessings of a good thick skirt, said Mary Kingsley after she crashed into a cleverly concealed leopard pit. 15 feet deep and lined with 12-inch ivory spikes. I should have been spiked to the bone and done for, she explained, whereas here I was with the fullness of my skirt tucked under me. The place was equatorial West Africa. The year was 1895, and the spunky lady saved, thanks to her firm adherence to the dress code of the day, was a young Englishwoman who had come to Africa to collect species of fish and beetles for the British Museum. Until the age of 30, Mary Kingsley was strictly a dutiful daughter who nursed her invalid mother and rarely ventured outside her London home. Her father, on the other hand, as the personal physician to travel-minded aristocrats, was always wandering off to exotic places from which he sent his family long, detailed letters about his adventures. When Mary was six and already doing household chores, such a letter arrived from the South Pacific. It contained a hair-raising account of how he had been shipwrecked on a coral reef near a cannibal-infested island. Included were descriptions of plant and animal life for the learned one, as he called Mary. Although she received no formal education, that was reserved for her younger brother Charles, Mary had somehow learned to read and loved nothing better than to lose herself in the books in her father's library. Science, travel, exploration and piracy, subjects considered unsuitable for girls in Victorian days, were especially exciting to Mary. The European exploration of Africa was reaching a high point in the second half of the 19th century and much of what she read was current news. Dr. David Livingstone, who ventured farther into the unknown regions of Africa than had any other white man before him, was a favorite of Mary's. His respect and obvious love for the African peoples he wrote about made a strong impression on her. From an inquisitive young girl, at one point she was granted permission to teach herself German, but only after she could starch and iron a skirt properly. Mary grew up to be an unusual teenager. While still at home, she taught herself chemistry, experimented with gunpowder and electricity, and became engrossed by the intricacies of plumbing. Her favorite reading at this time was a periodical called The English Mechanic. As the years passed, Mary became increasingly tied to her mother's bedside, rarely leaving it for more than an hour at a time. Then, in 1892, her father died unexpectedly. Two months later, her mother also died. This was a terrible blow to Mary, but out of it came a sudden and powerful conviction. With a small inheritance left to her, she was now free to journey to the land of her childhood dreams, West Africa. When Mary crashed into the leopard pit in 1895, she was on her second visit to West Africa, traveling up the mighty Ogwo River in what was then French Congo, now Gabon. She was pressing her luck trying to get to know the notorious fangs, repeatedly a tribe of cannibals. This was part of what she called her fish and fetish mission. The fish were for the British Museum. The fetish referred to a study she was conducting of the region's religious beliefs and customs. Her father had been involved with such studies and to Mary this was a way of carrying on his work. In search of the fangs, Mary was traveling by a dugout canoe with four native paddlers, pushing north toward yet another grand river, the Rambouille. At low tide, the waterways they followed became trails of stinking slime. They met with hippos and sandbanks, once they were marooned in a crocodile-infested lagoon. When one of the reptiles tried to climb aboard, Mary was there with a paddle. 
ready to fetch him a clip on the snout. Sometimes progress meant trekking through the heavy gloom of the rainforest. It was rough going and the leopard pit incident was just part of a day that had begun with a herd of charging elephants, continued gorillas gambling across the path and included killing a snake as thick as a man's thigh. Later they cooked the snake for supper. One evening, approaching a fang village, they were suddenly confronted by a surge of tribesmen brandishing guns and knives. Fortunately, the village chief recognized one of the paddlers as an old friend. The fang's dietary habits remained a mystery until days later, in another village, Mary noticed an unpleasant smell emanating from some small bags hanging in her guest hut. Pouring their contents into her hat, she found a human hand, four eyes, three big toes, and two ears. The remnants of had once been a fang dinner. Repugnant though this was, Mary took it in stride. She was later to discover many admirable qualities in the fangs, such as courage and commitment to family. After nearly a year of high adventure, Mary returned to England late in 1895, where she wrote about her experiences in a book called Travels in West Africa, published in 1897. It became an instant success, and she became a sought-after lecturer and celebrity. In her public appearances, she could be both serious and funny, peppering her narrative with plenty of jokes, often at her own expense. Mary was critical of the way the British colonialists had steamrolled their way into the African continent with blatant disregard for its ancient cultures. In her lectures, she was quick to voice her displeasure. In her second book, West African Studies, she combined research on tribal customs with her views on what should be Britain's political role in Africa. In 1900, she sailed to Africa for the third time. But instead of going directly to her beloved West Coast, she responded to an urgent call for nurses in South Africa where a war between British colonialists and Dutch settlers was underway. Assigned to a hospital in which the soldiers were dying by the hundreds from a raging epidemic, she became ill herself. She died two months later and was buried at sea with military honor. In travels in West Africa, Mary remembered the Rembwe River. For three days, her roost had been a bamboo platform at the stern of a roomy canoe with an old quilt for sail. The captain, a big friendly trader, was curled up at her feet, fast asleep after giving her night watch. Indeed, as much as I have enjoyed life in Africa, I do not think I ever enjoyed it to the full as I did when dropping down the Rembwe. The great black winding river with a pathway in its midst where the moonlight struck it. Ah, give me a West African river and a canoe for sheer pleasure. The end. <laughs>